Manna. What was manna? There have been all kinds of theories proposed by scholars over the years. Some have posited that it was a desert lichen, or others that it was the secretion from uh, tamarisk trees that are common in, in the area. My favorite uh, theory is that it, it was beetle cocoons that uh, had a sweet taste. But uh, all of these theories, it seems to me, are a bit forced when it comes down to it. No one has really been able to find a substance in the deserts of the Sinai Peninsula that matches the description of manna from Exodus. The explanation of manna leaves us hungering for more. And that is exactly what Jesus told his disciples. No matter what it was made of, it still left those who ate it hungry. It was a foreshadowing, a tentative gift, if you will, an appetizer, the promise of a greater food to come. As we get into the heart of John's chapter 6 this week, we find Jesus' most clear teaching about the Eucharist unfolding. And we also hear about spiritual hunger and thirst. It's common for our reflection about the Eucharist to jump right into the blessing of spiritual food and drink without spending much time on the hunger and thirst it satisfies. We speak so quickly about the bread come down from heaven. But perhaps we need to also talk a little bit about the pangs of hunger that afflict us on earth. And I think the gospel today invites us to pause for a moment and reflect on spiritual hunger and thirst, on the empty heart the Eucharist is meant to satisfy. As your new rector here in Portland, I think it's a beautiful mystery to reflect on. Portland is a city of about 67,000 souls. Of those, only about 4,000 are registered in our parish. Parishes. And only 1,000 of those, about a quarter of our registered parishioners, have been coming to the 10 weekend or Sunday masses in recent weeks. That means our community is filled with hungry people. And I don't think you need a theology degree to figure that out. Does not the evidence of widespread spiritual hunger and thirst not surround us immediately when we walk out these doors? Particularly in these days still lived under the shadow of the pandemic. I would say the dominant sentiment reflected on the streets and in many of our own homes is one of listlessness, uneasiness, fatigue, and isolation. The emotional and spiritual energies of so many have been sapped. The ability to extend ourselves outward, to connect in a meaningful and authentic way with others, has been compromised. All the while that we live in a time so rich with manna, with earthly blessings. You know, we, uh, we can treat pain in miraculous ways. We live in unimagined comfort. We travel with ease. We can communicate with just about anyone on the planet whenever we want we can easily access the most insignificant details about lands halfway across the planet. We spend time with those we like. We can avoid those we don't. We love who we want. We have children we want to have. And if none of this makes us happy, we can distract ourselves with screens and substances aplenty. In recent months, Many of us had not even had to leave our homes for groceries. 
or fast food or work or education, without barely raising a finger, just a little click, all this manna comes to us, feeding us with every sort of earthly food and drink. Yet the more we consume of these earthly blessings, the more we are consumed by them, the more we lose ourselves, and the less we have to give. That's what manna does. It leaves us hungry. It is not true food. It is not true drink. And yet, like the Israelites in the gospel today, we keep asking for it, don't we? We keep asking Jesus for the manna, for the earthly blessings. Just let me win the Powerball. I know it would really satisfy. Please let me find the right man, the right woman, the right job, the neighborhood, the family, the car, the phone, the drug, the treatment. Help me find my manna, the earthly food that will make me happy because I'm restless and tired. I know what I need. I just need you to give it to me. There was a colony of Germans that arrived in mid-coast Maine in, the early, I think it was in the 1700s, and they abandoned their settlement after a horrible winter filled with many deaths due to starvation. And the irony of it was that they were dying of hunger while lobsters were washing up on the beach. Makes sense to me. I have German ancestry and I know the way they feel about seafood. But, but if you think about the tragedy, when there is abundant food to be starving, it's heart-wrenching, or it should be. And it should be particularly heart-wrenching every time a Catholic sees a sign of that hunger in the world. A young person who has died of an overdose. The frustrated face of someone who just cut us off in traffic. A strong whiff of spirits or pot in the air again. A belligerent customer storming out of a shop or arguing with exhausted wait staff looking through the window of a nursing home, seeing lonely eyes, looking back. Hungry people, starving people, all the while that we know there is food that will satisfy. We know the bread of life. We know where he dwells. Seeing this tragic hunger in our world is what really led me to enter the seminary. It is a harvest waiting for laborers. But if priests are the only laborers, the only ones able to help a hungry world, how tragic will this story be? Pope Francis called the parish a field hospital. He takes for granted that we all, all of us, understand Christ to be the remedy, to be the treatment, to be the food for a starving world. That handing on of faith is not about bringing others to an exclusive religious club, but to a breadline for hungry souls. This work, what happens here is so much bigger than any of us. It is the work of Jesus himself, feeding his flock, his people, and giving them eternal life. And so our biggest concern, it seems to me, is just not to get in the way of that, to help one another find ways to be a part of Jesus' saving work in daily life. 
A bread line requires more people than just the ones serving the food. How do we live our faith at home, in our community? How do we organize ourselves? How do we reach out? It's not the kind of thing that the pastor, pastor or rector or whoever it is can figure out alone. We have to figure this out together. How do we feed a hungry world? Or at least not get in the way. One day at a time, I hope that we can pray and talk together and work together to find big and small opportunities to help our spiritual, spiritually hungry brothers and sisters. And I encourage you, let us put aside earthly pettiness and superficiality and gossip and rivalries and jealousies, forgiving one another and caring for each other so we don't get in the way of the heavenly bread line that is so much bigger than any of us. We live in a hungry world, and we are blessed to be friends with the one who can feed it.